In accordance with Tennessee Code Section 844-108, Section C-3, I have two questions to ask for everyone who is on the phone. Um, so who presently is on the phone? Catherine Kanata. Okay. So Catherine, are you able to hear us uh, clearly so that you can participate in this meeting? Yes, I can. Okay. And can you please identify any persons present in the room with you from those who are present and participating in this meeting? Uh, only I'm in the room by myself. Okay. Uh, Mike O'Malley, and the same answers are appropriate. I can hear you, and no one's in the room. Okay. And for those present, Trustee Atkins. Yes. Okay. Are you able to hear those participating yes. electronically? All right. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Are you able to hear those? Okay. And Trustee Rayburn. Yes. And you can hear those participating yes. electronically. Okay. And Trustee Willinius. Yes. All right. Um, Chairman, I do not detect a fiscal quorum present. However, a quorum does exist by the inclusion of those members participating by electronic means. And in accordance with TCA 844-108, Section B2, I would offer up to the, to the board the following circumstances which necessitate the reason for holding this meeting. APSU Policy 6004 requires the board to make a final determination within a reasonable time when a complaint is filed um, for discrimination. A complaint of discrimination was filed on May the 25th, 2017, and the investigator made his conclusion on July 19th, 2017. And so in order to meet the reasonableness standard, it became necessary to call a special meeting for the board to make its determination. So Chairman, I ask that a motion be made and a roll call vote be taken for determination on the necessity of holding this meeting. An affirmative vote will signify that a necessity does exist for this meeting to proceed. Um, a dissenting vote will signify that a necessity does not exist for this meeting to continue. Uh, so based on the information provided by Ms. Whiteside, I move that we determine that necessity has been established to hold this meeting in the absence of a physical quorum. Is there a second? Second. Uh, uh, Trustee Jenkins has seconded the motion. It is moved and seconded that necessity has been established to hold this meeting in the absence of a physical quorum. Any discussion? Hearing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Present. Trustee Kanata. Present. Trustee Jenkins. Present. Trustee O'Malley. Present. Trustee Rayburn. Present. You all said present, but I need an affirmative vote of whether or not this, this necessity has been established. So let's do that again. Trustee Atkins. I'm sorry, what? what? Has necessity been established to? Yes. Okay. Trustee Kanata. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Okay. So the motion carries. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask to recognize Danelle Whiteside in her role as general counsel to briefly explain the policy and process around how the university handles complaints of discrimination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we talk about the investigation report, I think it's important to briefly explain policy 6004, which is discrimination and harassment complaints other than complaints of sexual violence, the complaint and investigation procedure, which is the policy that governs the investigation of allegations of discrimination. It's important to note that discrimination may occur by treating individuals less favorably because of their race, color, gender, other and other um, protected categories, and also having a policy or practice that disproportionately adversely impacts a protected class. In this case, the complainant, Jessica Morris, alleged that President White and Dr. Rex Gandy discriminated against her on the basis of sex when the decision was made to fail the search for a position that she applied for. When a complaint of discrimination is filed, the university is obligated to investigate the complaint in a prompt and equitable manner, which is usually 60 days absent some extenuating circumstances. Typically, complaints are filed with the Director of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action and are investigated by that office under the direction of the Office of Legal Affairs. However, because this allegation of discrimination was made against the President, per the policy, the Board, through the Chair, appointed Blaine Clements, who is Director of Internal Audit, to serve as the investigator. Since Mr. Clements reports directly to the Board and not to the President, 
This ensured that there would be no impartiality throughout the investigation. Let me also note that President White and Dr. Gandhi, also the complainant, are not in attendance at this meeting so that you all will feel free to engage in a robust discussion of the investigative report. Before Mr. Clements presents his investigation report, let me remind you of your charge here today. Per university policy, you are required to review the investigator's report and make a final written determination as to whether a violation has occurred and what the appropriate resolution should be, if any. Let me pause and ask who joined the line. Uh, Trustee Mueller. Okay, great. And Trustee Mueller, I have to ask you a quick question. Are you able to hear me clearly so that you can participate in this meeting? Yes, I am. Okay, and are you able to distinguish my voice from any voice that might be in the room with you? Uh, yes. Okay, all right. Um, now I'll ask um, Mr. Clements to briefly explain um, his findings in his report. Good morning, trustees. You have all been provided a copy of the report. I would like to provide you with, a conclu with the conclusion of the investigation and a verbal summary of the investigation investigative process, after which I will address any concerns or questions that you may have. The investigation included interviewing the complainant, the respondents, and various other university staff, as well as a review of various university policies and accreditation standards. Based on the investigation performed, it is my conclusion that the claim of gender discrimination could not be substantiated. The evidence indicates the search was failed because the complainant did not have the recognized terminal degree as required by university policy. Allow me to summarize the complaint. The complainant was selected by a search committee as the successful candidate in the search for an associate professor in the Department of Communications. However, the complainant was not hired. The provost failed his job search because the complainant did not possess the terminal degree required by university policy. The provost discussed his, his decision to fail the search with the president. The president supported the decision. The complainant filed a complaint of gender discrimination because a male who had a master's degree and not a doctorate was hired in, the, in a similar position in the Department of Communications a year earlier. The investigation included a review of various policies. The Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, SACS, is a university accrediting body. SACS Standard 3.7.1 Faculty Credentials states that faculty teaching baccalaureate courses must have a, quote, doctorate or master's in the teaching discipline or master's with a concentration in the teaching discipline. It further states, when evaluating faculty credentials, that, quote, an institution give primary consideration to the highest earned degree in the discipline. University Policy 2-051, Faculty appointment, Appointments, is more restrictive. The minimal cri criteria for the rank of associate professor requires, quote, an earned doctorate from an accredited institution in the instru instructional discipline or related area, or a master's degree in the instructional discipline when that master's degree is the recognized terminal degree in that instructional discipline. In a memo dated July 14, 2014, the Tennessee Board of Regents states the terminal degree for the Department of Communication is, quote, the earned doctorate. However, the Department of Communication's retention, tenure, and promotion criteria, commonly referred to as the RTP, defines the terminal degree for that department as, quote, an, un an earned doctorate or MA or MFA in the discipline or related area. Uh, this is in direct conflict with the university policy because it does not recognize the master's degree must also be the recognized terminal degree for the discipline. It appears that the RT RTP was used to create the job description for the search in question as well as the search which resulted in the hiring of the male which is cited in the complaint. Neither the complainant nor the male and hired in 2016 have the recognized terminal degree required by policy. The investigation also reviewed to determine what extent the president and the provost participated in the hiring processes. In their written statement, the president and the provost both stated they are not actively involved in the hiring of faculty. In a document dated February 2016, the president delegated to the dean of college and arts and letters the authority to approve and execute employment contracts in the College of Arts and Letters, which houses the Department of Communication. The dean signed the employment contract for the male cited in the, in the complaint. 
Although the provost office approval is required in the university's human resource system to hire the male, the approval was granted by the assistant to the provost, not the provost. The assistant to the provost stated her approval in the system is an acknowledgement that all proper approvals have been obtained. It was not an acknowledgement that the candidate met the minimum qualifications for the position. No employment contract was signed for the complainant. Given recent efforts to improve faculty pay, the provost stated he has requested deans to consult with him on the salaries of new faculty members. This was not the practice when the male was hired in 2016. It was during this conversation with the dean that the provost noted the lack of terminal degree, and he cites the lack of terminal degree as the reason the search was failed. The investigation included reviewing various, excuse me, the investigation included reviewing previous hiring and promotions to determine if a pattern of discrimination exists. The investigation included a detailed review of recent hires and promotions in the Department of Communications during the provost's tenure at the university. The results of this analysis is included in the report. I believe it's on page six. Uh, no gender discrimination, no gender discriminatory patterns were discovered. The provost mentioned in his written response to the complaint that the Department of Communication has faculty teaching post-baccalaureate courses who do not have the recognized terminal degree. Again, SAC standards 3.7.1 faculty credentials states that faculty teaching graduate and post-baccalaureate courses must have, quote, an earned doctorate slash terminal degree in the teaching discipline or related disciplines, unquote. In his written response to the complaint, the provost states, the department is using non-terminal degree faculty in the graduate program already. The, pro the provost cites this as evidence that the department is currently in violation of the SAC standard. He adds, quote, hiring additional faculty without the terminal degree would only exasper exasperate the problem, unquote. Since this speaks to the rationale of the provost's decisions to fail the search, the investigation researched this claim and confirmed that indeed the Department of Commun Communication is using non-terminal degree faculty, <coughs> excuse me, to teach post-baccalaureate classes. This is the, the results of this analysis is included on the report on page seven. Again, our conclusion is, based on the investigation performed, it is my conclusion that the claim of gender discrimination could not be substantiated. The evidence indicates the search was failed because the recommended candidate, the complainant, did not have the recognized terminal degree as required by university policy. I'd welcome any questions that you might have. The one question I had as I read through this and made notes is, does the Human Resource Department of the University review all job postings and assure that degree requirements at whatever level are stated in the job opening posting, or exactly how does that work? I think the, the job descriptions are created at the department level. They're approved through the HR system, which would include the dean. That, that also goes through uh, human resources, it goes through uh, affirmative action, goes through a series of steps. Um, each piece, each person I think is looking at different things and relying on other people's um, approvals. So, so um, I think the, as far as making sure the job description is, is correct, I think would be more uh, with the chair or the dean, not mm -hmm. necessarily with human resources. Okay. One, one question. Yes, um, ma'am. In, in talking to um, uh, people in the uh, communications department, um, at any time did anyone offer some alternative qualification that they were planning to cite in lieu of a uh, uh, terminal degree uh, for the people who are not talking about the complainant, but the people who are currently uh, with master's degrees who are currently teaching uh, post-baccalaureate courses. Did, did that come up? Was there uh, anything offered there? Uh, we, we did talk to a number of people in the Department of Communications who were, de, um, who were involved in this hiring process. Um, as far as an um, other set of credentials or, or certifications, I don't recall anyone mentioning that. Okay. But the, the policy does allow both. So the, the mail was hired when we were under TBR. 
uh, the complainant was uh, that job search was under right. the board of trustees. So there's okay. two sets of policies, but they mirror each other right. uh, in, 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 a, in a great extent. Uh, there is a, an ability for the president to to request of either the board of trustees or uh, the TBR back back when to provide an exception to the right. minimum uh, qualifications. And as far as we could tell, that exception has never been okay. uh, right. brought forward. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Blaine, this, this is uh, Trustee O'Malley. Uh, um, I can see where, and you've done a good job, I think, in, in your investigation, so thank you. Um, I, I can see where there is no, uh, you know, reason for a claim of gender discrimination. Are we still, though, outside of the policy in the communications department at, in terms of um, the qualifications of the teacher, of the the uh, professors in that department. Uh, yes, yeah, so we did note in our investigation that there are people, there are faculty members in the Department of Communications who do not have the recognized terminal degree of the doctorate. And as it says in the report, that some of those faculty members who do not have the terminal degree are also teaching graduate classes, which is a SACS issue. So, um, as to management's plan to, to rectify that, I'd, I'm not aware of what actions they might be considering. Okay. Thank you. Blaine, have there been other complaints of discrimination uh, in the last several years? Um, this is the only one. This, I've only been here since April of 2016. This has only come to me because it includes the president. I don't know if I have the information to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. But none that you know of. It sounds like none that you know of. I, I would assume if there were any allegations made against the president while I was here, I would, have, I would be made aware of it. Okay. Okay, so we have heard, I'm sorry. Okay, we've heard Ms. Whiteside's explanation and Mr. Clement's summary of the investigation and findings. Do we have a motion to adopt the report of Blaine Clements, thereby affirming that no violation has occurred? I so move. So motion uh, by Trustee Jenkins, is there a second? I'll second. Second. Uh, second by Trustee Atkins. Uh, it is moved and seconded that the report of the investigator be approved. Is there any additional discussion? Yeah, I, would, I just, I noted, uh, Mr. Chairman, a couple of things as I read through this, and I read it a couple of times. And I noticed Dr. Gandhi, and I have full confidence in the administration of the university, but in his first line on his written response, to quote him, a tenure track faculty is higher of one of the most important decisions that a university makes. But as I read through this, uh, a lot of these positions, the president's not involved in the hiring or doesn't review the hiring when it's one of the most important decisions that a university makes. Uh, I'm, kind of comparing it to my own business, I guess, just, uh, and I know there's a lot more goes on here than goes on in my business, so I don't exactly, I guess, understand or, or match up the comments there. But I would suggest going forward um, that all job postings in any department, that there be something like a clearinghouse in the HR department that matches the posting, the requirements, uh, degree uh, that they would match that to policy and be sure that it, that the posting is correct. I think maybe that's where a breakdown may have been here. I will say that as of June 1, Dr. Gandhi has, uh, is looking at all new hires paperwork to make sure that they have the minimum qualifications. That's no longer done at the, in this case it was at the dean level. He's, right. he's now taken that inside of his office and is looking at those to make sure that all future hires meet the minimum no, qualifications. Okay. Discussion. 
Dusty Atkins. Hearing none, the question is on adopting the investigator's report. Because this is an electronic meeting, we must have a roll call vote for this item. Secretary, please call the Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Rayburn? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Uh, thank you. The motion is carried. Um, before we adjourn, as a reminder, the next regularly scheduled meeting of the full board of trustees will take place on September 14 and 15. Um, and, uh, Danelle, before uh, I move for adjournment, uh, did you want to mention the August meeting uh, in Nashville with the, the other boards and the governor? Sure. Um, the Tennessee Higher Education Commission is hosting a higher edu education summit with all of the with our trustees and all of the other trustees from the other university um, boards. So we're looking forward to getting together. That's the um, sort of last part in the professional development that you all are required to undergo as far as um, what's required in the FOCUS Act. So um, we're looking forward to it. I think you all get some good information and we look forward to seeing you in Nashville. Uh Great. So that said, I move that we adjourn this special meeting of the Austin State University Board of Trustees. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. It is moved and seconded that the meeting adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Uh, the ayes have it, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.